Hi everyone, welcome to the period three content review. This review is gonna cover all the key details from period three, starting with the cause of the revolution and all the way through John Adams' turbulent presidency. If you feel you need a little extra help with certain parts, feel free to check out the timestamps below for specific sections. All right, here we go. Our first skill is gonna be causation and our first topic is the Declaration of Independence. So what were the causes of the Declaration of Independence? I'm not gonna cover every single cause, but we'll highlight several of them and the flow of events that led up to the Declaration of Independence. To start off, the cause of the Declaration of Independence, we need to go back to the previous war and the beginning of period three, the French and Indian War. This war was fought between the French and their Indian allies versus the British and their Indian allies. This was a global conflict, but for US history, we are most concerned with the struggle for the control of the Ohio River Valley, which lies west of the Appalachian Mountains. The British won the war, but it was very costly, and they're going to need some extra revenue. Now let's take a look at things, how things will change for colonists. Before the war, the American colonists enjoyed a degree of autonomy under a system of sal salutary neglect, in which the British allowed the colonists to run many of its own affairs in the colonies, including self-government, albeit with British oversight. The British were also lax in its enforcement of mercantilist laws like the Navigation Acts. In a mercantilist system, the colonies are supported to be uh, are supposed to be a resource and tax base for the mother country. However, the American colonists skirted a lot of these laws through smuggling. After the war, all of this changed as the British became far more hands-on in the governing of their colonies. Let's take a look at the restrictions of colonist movement um, as a cause for the Declaration of Independence. One of the first acts to draw the ire of colonists was the Proclamation Act of 1763 which forbid colonists from moving across the Appalachian Mountains. This impacted settlers looking to farm the rich soil of the Ohio River Valley and fur traders looking to trap animals in the region. Later on, the Quebec Act passed, which was a part of a series of acts the colonists dubbed the Intolerable Acts. There were now a number of former Frenchmen in the British North American colonies after the British had defeated the French in the earlier war we discussed. The French were mostly Catholic, so the British extended the colony of Quebec, which was a Catholic colony. This angered the largely Protestant British colonists. Again, I'm only gonna just hit upon some of the taxes and laws that were passed in addition to some of the colonial responses. This is by no means comprehensive. In 1762, the writs of assistance were passed, which gave government officials um, the ability to search without warrants with the goal of trying to end smuggling. Along with the previously mentioned proclamation line in 1763, the British set about to more strictly enforce the Navigation Acts and the mercantilist system by restricting the colonial trade with only Great Britain. In 1765, the first Quartering Act was passed, and there will be another one with the Intolerable Acts later on. The Quartering Acts meant that the colonists may have to room and board British soldiers on their own dime. In 1765, the Stamp Act was passed, which meant taxes on official papers, legal documents, and newspapers. Colonists would protest, uh, protest this Stamp Act with the Stamp Act Congress, and they were successful, and it was repealed. However, it was replaced with the Townshend Acts, which the colonists then boycotted. In 1770, the Boston Massacre occurred, which was a colonial protest in Boston at a customs house. The stories of the event and who was to blame differ, but shots were fired by British soldiers and several colonists died. Paul Revere would create an engraving of the event, which was used as anti-British propaganda. A few years later was the 1773 Tea Act, which actually reduced the tax on the British India Tea Company so why complain? Well, it gave a monopoly uh, to the tea company and it had an advantage against the uh, colonist black market tea. This also leads to the Boston Tea Party. In 1774, the Intolerable Acts were passed, which closed the Boston Harbor. Town meetings were restricted. There was a new quartering act and the Quebec Act was all a part of them, which we previously mentioned. In 1775 and 1776, there were several colonial responses to the Intolerable Acts. Colony sent representatives to the Continental Congress, which drafted the Olive Branch Petition to the King of England, looking for compromise on British acts and a decrease in tensions. However, the King rejected it. Uh, early in 1776, Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense, which was a widely read pamphlet across all the colonies. Fighting had actually broken out well before the Declaration of Independence in some small-scale battles in Massachusetts. The British attempted to disarm Massachusetts militia, However, instead of disarmament, they found themselves in a serious series of small-scale pitch battles, including Lexington, Concord, and Bunker Hill. 
Okay, that does it for the causes of the Declaration of Independence. Subscribe to the channel for more AP U.S. History test review. Hello, everyone. Welcome to AP Sources Simplified. We are moving to the next historical thinking skill category of our AP review, which is looking at major turning points in U.S. history. If you're interested in the review assignment, it is in the video information below. In this video, we are looking at how much of a turning point was the Declaration of Independence. So we'll look at how much changed socially, politically, and economically with the signing of the Declaration of Independence as a fixed point in time. First, let's take a look at the economic realm. Before the Declaration of Independence, the American colonies were under the British mercantilist system. The preceding years had seen the British really clamp down on smuggling and restricting trade with only Great Britain. There had been a series of taxes the British government had tried out from the Stamp Act to Sugar and Tea Acts. The people most affected by these restrictions and taxes were large plantation owners, as they could not seek the highest bidders for their cash crops, and merchants, especially in northern, northeastern cities like Boston and New York. Most Americans were small-scale subsistence farmers, and these systems and taxes did not play a huge role in their lives. The immediate effect of the Declaration of Independence was a breakaway from the British mercantilist system. Now the trade restrictions are gone, and the taxes were gone. Looking further on, after the Declaration of Independence, the picture is a bit more muddled. Initially, there was economic turmoil, as the American currency was worthless. The U.S. owed a lot of money to foreign countries, and the government under the Articles had a hard time raising revenue through taxes. So the country's credit rating was terrible. For merchants, times were also difficult. While now they did not have to worry about the mercantilist system, they still had a hard time transporting and trading goods with European countries. Specifically, France and Great Britain had very little respect for American merchants and would regularly seize ships and impress sailors into their navies. This did not totally gum up trade, though, as the South now had a strong European market bidding for their cash crops. Once the Constitution was passed and Washington became the first president, a stronger central government meant more national coordination with the economy. Hamilton's economic program was enacted, which brought about controversial tariffs, a national bank, and imposed an excise tax on whiskey. All of these led to division within the U.S., but the economy began to stabilize and grow. Next, let's take a look at the social landscape. In this category, there are, a whole, there are not a whole lot of changes. Before the Declaration of Independence, the social ladder looked like this. You had British officials on top, then colonial elites, which would include everyone from large plantation owners to wealthy merchants. Then the vast majority of Americans who are small-scale subsistence farmers. Looking at specific social groups, free men are clearly at the top, with free women having few rights at all below them, and slaves of any gender at the bottom. The immediate effect of the Declaration of Independence is throwing the British officials off the ladder. The colonial elites take their spot, but everyone else pretty much stays the same. Despite the Declaration of Independence having grand ideas about life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and equality, that seemed to be meant for only a few, as it would take a long time for America to live up to those ideals. There were a few calls for equality from Abigail Adams, who wrote to founding father John Adams and asked him to remember the ladies when forming the government of this new country but by and large, the ladies will be forgotten. And while some Northern states do abolish slavery, it will actually expand in the following decades from the growth of cotton as a cash crop and new territories added into the union. Plus the system itself does not change a bit as chattel slavery's brutality will remain. The political sphere is where we see the most change. Before the Declaration of Independence, the British government had severely constrained political freedoms. The best example being the Intolerable Acts. Decades prior, colonial legislatures had considerable autonomy under salutary neglect, but right before the Declaration, they had been limited to what they could do. Town means in England, New England were restricted, and colonists could be searched and belongings seized with no warrant. Finally, colonists saw less protections and trials as the British government's grip tightened. The immediate effect of the Declaration of Independence cannot be politically understated. It overhauled the political system. Now Americans had to set up their own government, and partially because of their ex previous experience under, in their view, British tyranny, colonial leaders set up a very weak central government called the Articles of Confederation. It was clear the state governments had most of the sovereignty, but this would also doom the Articles of Confederation to failure. A myriad of problems arose during the time of the Articles of Confederation, and it was decided that they needed to be thrown out in favor of a stronger centralized government. The Constitution replaced the Articles in 1789, in which the central government gained power and sovereignty while the states lost it. Two years later, the Bill of Rights were added to the Constitution, which enhanced individuals' freedoms and rights, on paper anyways. Under the second president, John Adams, it was shown how these freedoms could be curtailed as his administration passed the Alien Sedition Acts. 
But now it was the American federal government curtailing freedom, not the British. Okay, that does it for analyzing how much of a turning point the Declaration of Independence was. Like the video, subscribe to the channel for more AP review and primary source explanations. Hello everyone, today we're going to cover a couple of topics that are all linked together. We're going to start with America's first attempt at a national government, the Articles of Confederation. That government will encounter a lot of problems, so a convention is held to draft a new government under a constitution. Many important topics are debated at the convention, which will be covered in this video. And finally, the constitution is sent out to states for ratification. While that process is going on, two camps emerge, one in support of the constitution and one against. They will write numerous essays in newspapers detailing their arguments for and against the Constitution. Okay, let's go. The United States is a brand new country and affirms that with the Treaty of Paris in 1783, officially ending the Revolutionary War. While the war was won, the Founding Fathers still had to tackle some big questions for their prize of establishing a new country. Which are, will the former colonies consolidate themselves into a large country, or are the former colonies free to govern themselves as independent countries? Along the same lines, if the former colonies are one large country, will they be tightly organized like the British government or loosely organized, more like the Iroquois Confederacy? What will it look like? Also, an immediate pressing issue are the big war debts that the Continental Congress incurred fighting the British. They owed powerful lenders, and the money they attempted to print and circulate was nearly worthless. If the United States did not get its act together, there is a chance it would not exist for long. So the Articles of Confederation were created by the Continental Congress in 1777, under some duress, as the Revolutionary War had not been going well up to that point. The final approval by the states occurred in 1781. Government under the Articles was set up with a Congress that was a dominant force. There were no executive or judicial branches. It was also hobbled by rules, including all bills required two-thirds vote for passage, which is very difficult to get. Also, any amendments to the Articles, so to make a change to the rules or structure of the government, required a unanimous vote. Again, nearly impossible. Then, each state had one vote, which definitely annoyed the larger and more populous states. Economically, the government created quite a mess, as there were no powers to regulate commerce, so states could put different tariffs on foreign products, and even tariffs on products traded between the states. Finally, it had no power to tax. The government could only request states pay taxes to the national government. There were a few successes though, and for those, we can point to the Land Ordinance Act of 1785 and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Both of these helped to organize the Northwest Territories, the area seen here on the map. Another really key aspect was that slavery would be forbidden in the Northwest. While never a light topic in pre-Civil War America, we are in a time period that such a clause could pass. It also helped to have the support of a Virginian, Thomas Jefferson. There is no chance this would pass in the early to mid 1800s in the run up to the Civil War. Now, let's run through the problems with the Articles, of which there were many. First, the U.S. could not command respect from other countries. Great Britain continued to treat the U.S. somewhat like a colony. They did not send an ambassador and still manned forts in the Northwest Territories. Spain had seized lands granted to the U.S. and harassed trade on the Mississippi River. And France demanded repayment of loans made during the Revolution. And they took actions against the U.S. to force repayment. Under the Articles, there really was not much the United States could do as it would be very difficult to raise a national army and navy without the ability to tax. Domestically, there were a myriad of problems that the Articles failed to fix. Some states were not contributing revenue to the national government, and this led to debt problems with foreign countries and an inability to do much of any type of improvements or ability to pay wages to war veterans. The national economy was in shambles, which was being made worse with no unifying economic policy, and states having the power to do what they please with their own economic policies, including levying duties on each other's products and quarreling over boundaries. Then a significant rebellion broke out in western Massachusetts. It was led by Daniel Shays, who along with fellow frustrated farmers had lost their farms due to mortgage foreclosures and tax delinquencies. The problem with this rebellion was twofold. One, many of the farmers were former Revolutionary War veterans that got paid in worthless continental dollars. And two, the national government had a very hard time putting down the rebellion, as the national government had a hard time keeping an army supplied, paid, and together. This led prominent leaders to worry about the inability of the national government to hold the country together. The calls for reform led to the Annapolis Convention, which was supposed to be focused on a couple of issues. But quickly, leading figures requested a new convention to meet in Philadelphia and figure out how to reform the Articles of Confederation altogether. Now we are at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. It was led by the great George Washington in a masterful document crafted by the research and ideas of James Madison. 
There is an early decision to write a new government rather than tinker with the Articles Confederation. There were definitely concerns about this. However, Washington provided a steady hand of leadership. There are different interpretations about the intent of the Founding Fathers at the convention. Famous historian Charles Beard says that it was more about protecting property and rights for the wealthy and making America safe from democracy. Then there is the idealistic interpretation that the attendees were looking to make a better country or more perfect union, as stated in the preamble. Finally, there is the pragmatic interpretation that the leaders were dealing with so many questions of where sovereignty resides, the states or national government. And there was a need to place common interests over re regional or personal concerns in order to create a stable government and country. Now let's take a look at the many important compromises. First and foremost was the debate over the makeup of the legislature. There were two major ideas or plans for this. The first was the Virginia plan or large states plan proposed by Edmund Randolph. It consisted of a two house legislature with representation based on population for both. And the president and courts would be chosen by the legislature. This would obviously shift a considerable amount of power to the large states. Next was the New Jersey plan, also sometimes called the small states plan. Its government was a bit more similar to the Articles Confederation government with one legislature in each state having one vote. The difference was there would be a creation of an executive branch chosen by the legislature and also the inclusion of a judicial branch. It increased the powers of Congress from what was in the articles, but it's easy to see why smaller states would be more supportive of this plan. So the founders reach a great compromise that was a bit more based on the Virginia plan than the New Jersey plan, but it does throw the small states a bone. So Congress would be made up of two houses. The lower house is based upon population, something the larger states wanted and the upper house would be the bone thrown to the smaller states, as states would have two members from each state in the Senate, so representation not based upon population. Okay, there are a few other important compromises. First is the three-fifths compromise, which says that slaves were to be counted at 60% for representation and taxation, and there would be no congressional interference with slavery for 20 years. So states with few slaves or had banned slavery did not want slaves to be counted, as that would put them at a disadvantage for representation in the House. Slave states wanted them counted, but not taxed, for obvious reasons. The final compromise I am covering here is the Commerce Compromise, which stated that there would be no tax on exports, which, why would you, as that only hurts your own economy, and there would only need a simple majority in the legislature for commerce bills, making it much easier for commerce bills to pass. Again, there were competing interests along regional lines, as the southern cash crop dominated states wanted it to be more difficult to levy tariffs because European countries may retaliate with their own tariffs on those cash crops. And northern states wanted to make it easier to tax imports in order to protect their small but growing manufacturing economy. Now let's take a look at the ratification process. The Constitution did not go immediately into effect after it was written. The states needed to approve it. An interesting piece of information is, Unlike the Declaration of Independence, which the Continental Congress required all colonies to approve of, the Constitution requirement was set to nine of the 13 states. Also, because of the opposition from state legislatures, conventions elected by the people were given authority to approve or reject the Constitution. Two sides sprung up in support and against the Constitution. Now, these are not political parties. However, their arguments will influence future political leaders and parties. Let's briefly take a look at their positions and the points from a couple of their famous essays. On the left side, we have some of the major issues both sides discuss in their essays. First is how strong should the federal or national government be? The Federalists led by Alexander Hamilton and James Madison argue in favor of the Constitution as it has more power instilled in it than the Articles did. The Anti-Federalists who worry about tyranny and state governments losing power argue the national government of the Constitution will be too strong. This is connected to the next issue, which is the power of the states. The Federalists are in favor of limiting state power, but throw the states a bone with the inclusion of the Senate, while the Anti-Federalists strongly support the power of states and are afraid of the power that will be lost in the Constitution. Next is the Bill of Rights, which Federalists are not necessarily against it, and this may depend on which Federalists you talk to, but in general they feel it may not be necessary. However, the Anti-Federalists say a Bill of Rights is essential, and they will win this part of the debate, as the Bill of Rights is added two years after the ratification of the Constitution. Okay, last three highlighted issues. The Federalists totally opposed the Articles of Confederation because of how inept that government was, while the Anti-Federalists support amending the Articles. This can be kind of seen in the New Jersey or Small States Plan. In the Size of a Nation discussion, Federalists would like to see a large, more tightly linked together republic, and that would be best for protection and security, while the Anti-Federalists favored a more, as Jefferson would call it, yeoman farmer republic. 
in which state and local governments were more important to the individual citizen than the national government. Finally, in general, who supported the sides? Federalists had the support of large farmers, merchants, and artisans, while anti-Federalists had the support of small farmers in the countryside. Of course, there are always exceptions to this. Lastly, let's take a look at the famous Federalist and Anti-Federalist arguments and papers. These essays were published in newspapers across the country while the ratification process was going on. First, we have Federalist Number 10, which argues that the Constitution establishes a government that can control the factions that will inevitably develop because of the nature of men. The Constitution will protect against the tyranny of the majority. Next is Federalist 51, which has the famous quote, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. It argues that checks on power in the various branches of government will balance out political factions. It is a similar argument to number 10 in that representative government is preferable to direct democracy, while it will still be responsive to the people. The Anti-Federalists argue in their essays that states are more responsive to their citizens than a national government, and the Constitution will not be able to manage a large country. The Anti-Federalists also worry about tyranny and complain there is no declaration of rights in the Constitution. In a branch, especially the executive, may become too powerful. So we know in the end, the Constitution will be ratified. However, the arguments of both Federalists and Anti-Federalists will live on. Okay, that does it for this overview of the Articles of Confederation, Constitutional Convention, and the Federalist-Anti-Federalist debates. Subscribe to the channel for more AP U.S. History Review. Hello, welcome to AP Sources Simplified. We are nearing the end of our AP exam review series. The last couple of videos were focused on comparing and contrasting. Today we are looking at the only governments the USA has had, the failed Articles of Confederation and our current government under the Constitution. This will just be a brief overview of the differences with some key details that would be great to use in an APUSH essay about the topic. Okay, so let's get into the comparison. First, the central government in the Articles of Confederation was weak, and this is what led to its downfall while the Constitution created a far stronger government than that of the Articles. Under the Articles, states had significant power, nearly as much as an independent country would, while the central government could barely do anything. Under the Constitution, there was a clear delegation of powers to both the federal government and state governments. While state governments have specific areas of control, like education, the federal government had sovereignty over the states. A brief comparison of the structure of both governments. The Articles really only had one branch, under which was a le legislature in which every state had a vote. It was difficult to get anything done because passing any bills required two-thirds of the states or more to agree, and pretty much impossible to make changes to the government as that required a unanimous consent from all states. The government under the Constitution is much larger and more intricate. There are three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. The legislative branch is bicameral, meaning two houses. The first is the House of Representatives, which is based on population. States with larger populations have more seats. And the other is the Senate, in which, every se in which every state is proportioned to senators. There are checks and balances to the power of the three branches, and I could go on for far longer. However, I'm going to keep this brief. Next, a major problem under the Articles Confederation were taxation and monetary issues. The government could only request states pay taxes and had no other way to collect revenue. This sent the United States credit and monetary system into a tailspin, as the U.S. owed debts to foreign countries from the Revolutionary War, in which it could not pay them off. Under the Constitution, the government has much more ability to tax and also regulate trade. This is seen in the whiskey tax, which was implemented shortly after the Constitution took hold, and tariffs that were inst instituted under Hamilton's financial program in the 1790s. Also, the Constitution was more elastic because of the necessary and proper clause, allowing for the government to do things that were not specifically stated in it, like have a national bank, although this would be very controversial, and I cover that topic with more depth in other videos. A few more comparisons to cover. First, as mentioned before, the government under the Articles had a hard time accomplishing anything, even the ability to put down small local rebellions seen in the Shays' Rebellion. There was no chance of other great powers ever taking the U.S. seriously. This changed under the Constitution. The government was able to legitimize its power when farmers in western Pennsylvania openly defied the whiskey tax and started a rebellion. Washington and his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, who had a real interest in seeing the con Constitution triumph, successfully put down the rebellion. Next, the Articles of Confederation had no Bill of Rights. It would not have been able to enforce them anyways. But the topic came up with the Constitution. Those who opposed the Constitution, the Anti-Federalists, demanded it be added as a protection against tyranny. Speaking of the Anti-Federalists, they had some well-known people in their camp that opposed the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry, to name a couple of them. But the other side also boasted well-known figures, like James Madison, who wrote most of it, 
and Alexander Hamilton. It also had the tacit support of George Washington. So what was the deal with the Anti-Federalists? Well, they were worried that the Constitution, with its strong central government, would lead to tyranny, and it goes against the reasons for the Revolution. On the other side, the Federalists worried the country would be unmanageable under the Articles of Confederation, and thus the Constitution was necessary. Okay, that does it for comparing the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. Like the video and subscribe to the channel for more AP Test Review and Primary Source Analysis. Hello, welcome to AP Sources Simplified. This is going to be a quick review today on the first two political parties in our nation's history, the Hamiltonian Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans. These parties formed during the presidency of George Washington were actively worried about the splintering of the country into factions. However, as you will see, these two groups had some major differences in ideology and direction the country should take. Okay, let's jump into it. To start, let's examine their views on the role of government in general. The Hamiltonian Federalists believed in the necessity of a strong central government, more akin to the British, while the Jeffersonian Republicans, always concerned about tyranny, emphasized states' rights and a limited central government. Diving down a little deeper into their thoughts on government, the Hamiltonians felt the Constitution should be interpreted loosely and felt the elastic clause allowed the government to do things outside of what is written in the Constitution. On the other hand, the Jeffersonian Republicans believed in the strict interpretation of the Constitution, so government should only be able to do what is allowed for in the words of the Constitution. For example, they opposed the creation of a national bank because the Constitution makes no mention of a national bank. Next is their difference on the direction the economy should take. Hamiltonians felt that the U.S. should go the route of the British and emphasize commerce and manufacturing, while the Jeffersonians preferred an agricultural-based economy. Jefferson called it a yeoman farmer republic. In foreign policy, they could not be more different as well, and tensions will be really high between the two camps on this topic. The Hamiltons favored the British as a source of stability and because of a common heritage, despite the ill will over the recent Revolutionary War, while the Jeffersonians favored the French, signaling both Fran France's support of the American Revolution and they felt the French Revolution was an extension of the American Revolution. The Republicans were outraged when the U.S. got into an undeclared quasi-war with France during the Adams administration. Lastly, the Hamiltonians emphasized the government playing a strong role in creating order and stability, while the Jeffersonians were always wary of a strong government, and they stressed protection of civil liberties and trust in the people. Okay, I told you that'd be a quick one. Like the video and subscribe to the channel for more AP Test Review and Primary Source Analysis. Hello, welcome to AP Sources Simplified. We are continuing on with our exam review and are into the next section, Contextualization. If you're interested in the review assignment, it is in the video information below. In this video, we are going to put John Adams' turbulent presidency in the context by taking a look at the situation John Adams was stepping into and some of the controversies of his presidency. After the ratification of the Constitution, George Washington won the first election for the presidency and was never in doubt he would become the first president. Washington, at the beginning of his presidency, was universally admired in the young republic. However, several difficult issues sprung up during his tenure that would have great influence on the difficulties in the John Adams presidency. One of the major issues was disagreements about what direction the country should take. On one side was Jefferson, who envisioned a yeoman farmer republic with a decentralized federal government. He also wanted the U.S. to ally with France in their revolution, believing it was an extension of the American Revolution. Plus, France was such a great ally to the U.S. during our own revolution. On the other side was Alexander Hamilton, who envisioned a merchant and industrialized economy with a strong centralized government. He wanted to more closely ally with Great Britain. While these two were competing for influence with Washington, John Adams was sidelined in the vice presidency role. These two competing ideologies ended up being the foundation of the first two national po political parties, the Hamiltonian Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans. Meanwhile, there were continuing issues with Great Britain, including the British not vacating forts in the Northwest Territories and harassing American merchants in a variety of ways. Washington sent John Jay to negotiate with the British, resulting in a treaty. Many back in the U.S. thought that the deal was a bad one for America. However, Washington was eager to avoid conflict. There were also problems with the French. As their revolution began, became more fanatical, they began to attempt to export it to other countries, including the U.S. The French sent over a diplomat named Citizen Genet, who caused trouble for Washington as he stirred up radical elements of the American populace. Washington was able to maintain American neutrality despite great pressure from various factions to more closely align the U.S. with either Great Britain or France. Washington also worried tremendously about the growing political parties and partisanism. 
These were central themes in his farewell address as he left office. However, both the international issues and partisanism were not solved under Washington, and they would fall to the next president, John Adams, who will have an extremely difficult time dealing with those issues. So the largest issue that Adams dealt with was the international problems, namely France. It also exasperated the political divisions within his own Federalist camp and with the opposition Jeffersonian Republicans. As mentioned before, the French Revolution had become more extreme, and France was acting more aggressive. They had started seizing American merchant ships, impressing sailors, and taking cargo. America sent diplomats to try to smooth the situation over, however, they were not afforded a normal diplomatic response, and instead were met by French bureaucratic middlemen who demanded a bribe, and the U.S. provide financial assistance to the French government. This was made public back in the U.S., and there was outrage amongst anti-French politicians, mostly in the Federalist camp. An undeclared naval war ensued with the French, now called the Quasi-War. However, it was not universally popular back in the U.S., as Jeffersonian Republicans hated the idea of war and bad relations with the French. Former President Washington urged Adams to appoint Hamilton as Major General, who began to make preparations for a large-scale war against the French. However, despite being in the same political camp, Adams and Hamilton did not get along at all. Hamilton thought little of Adams, and Adams thought Hamilton was too much of a political schemer and too eager for war with a powerful European nation. Within Adams' own camp were individuals more loyal to Hamilton than he, including the treasurer. They went behind Adams' back to support Hamilton's preparation for war. Eventually, Adams was able to reach a peace agreement with France, and shortly thereafter, he fired Hamilton's supporters. While Adams was losing influence in his own party, the opposition hated him even more. Elections were different in this time period as the runner-up became vice president, and so Adams' vice president was Thomas Jefferson. Those two men had been great friends during the Revolution, but now were bitterly divided, and soon into Adams' presidency, they were no longer on speaking terms. The pressure of his political enemies drove Adams and the Federalist Congress to pass the very controversial Alien and Sedition Acts. First, the Alien Act made it more difficult for immigrants to gain citizenship. The reason for it was that radical French immigrants would attempt to subvert the government with radical candidates for office. The act hurt the Jeffersonian Republicans as immigrants were a major base of support. The Sedition Act prohibited vocal and printed opposition to the government. This act took away First Amendment rights and was exactly what Jefferson had warned against ever since the Articles of Confederation were thrown out in favor of a strong centralized government in the Constitution. Some states even op openly defied the federal law. Virginia and Kentucky passed res resolutions declaring the law invalid as it went against constitutional rights. By the end of his presidency, John Adams was deeply unpopular and would go on to lose to Thomas Jefferson in the pivotal election of 1800. Okay, that does it for John Adams' turbulent presidency. If you liked the video, please click that like button, subscribe to the channel for more AP exam review and primary source analysis.